Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christine Williams. Coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints Hour. A white supremacist father loses custody of his children. Ottawa trying to shut down Vancouver's supervised drug injection site. And Canada is urging China to use its influence on Iran to rein in its nuclear weapons ambitions. Stay tuned. And these are the issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. A white supremacist father has lost custody of his two children. The case began in 2008 when one of the children showed up at school with a swastika and racist slogans written on her body in ink. Ottawa is headed to the Supreme Court of Canada to try to shut down Insight, Vancouver's supervised drug injection site. And Canada is urging China to use its powerful influence on Iran to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions. China has close trade relations with Iran, which it recently expanded. Meanwhile, scandal over a toy globe made in China, which wipes Israel out of existence. Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Stuart Parker is a lecturer at U of T and co-founder of the Toronto Democracy Initiative. Robert Metz is president of the Freedom Party of Ontario. And you, the viewer, are our third guest. Feel free and don't be shy to call in at any time with any of your comments about any of the subject matters we're addressing today. And that takes us to the first, taking a look at that upon your screen. White supremacist father loses Manitoba custody battle. Now this is a situation that began in 2008 in Manitoba. The child, grade two, shows up in school. She's got a swastika and slogans written on her body in ink. Now when she was questioned by authorities, here's what she said, and I'm quoting it directly here, quote, black people don't belong. What people don't understand is that black people should die unquote. Those are the quotations given by that young child when interviewed afterwards. On one hand, the state thinks that this child is being psychologically abused. To be raising a child in that kind of a climate is psychologically disruptive and destructive to the well-being of a child. On the other hand, lawyers are arguing for free speech. So what if you happen to be a racist? What if you happen to be prejudiced? Is it not your right to teach your children and raise your child how you see fit without having the state intervene? But of course it always involves a balance. It involves distinguishing what's free speech, what's hate speech, when the state should become involved. And that's where we want to hear what you, the viewer, think. Do you feel that Manitoba had that right to take those children away? Or do you think it was a case of a slippery slope, overstepping state boundaries and moving in to the private affairs of a family's business unwarranted. That's what we're addressing today. Huge implications here because these types of situations end up being groundbreaking. They end up having an impact all over society, like it or not, because it's a theme we're looking at here. It's an issue of rights, but again, whose rights? And I'm going to start with, this, with you on this one, Robert. What's your analysis of this? Who's, I don't who think, do you tend to side with here? I don't think it's an issue of freedom of speech, and I don't even think it's an issue of white supremacy. Um, the judge in this case made it very clear mm -hmm. At the end of the day, quote, this case is not so much about racism as it was a protection of children from poor parenting. And if that's the case, it seems to me, as I went through this, this mm -hmm. article, I'm, I don't know a lot about this case in terms yes. of the particular, so I'm a little uncomfortable in terms of if there's anything I don't know that's pertinent. But I'm going by what I do know. And what I know from this article is that um, the judge commented, quote, these two children have been exposed to a whole constellation of parental inadequacies. Mm -hmm. So I went through the article and I looked for one. Not a single one well, was the only mentioned quotation, other than the racist comment. Well, that's the thing, because and it says here, quote, emotionally abused through exposure to the parents' beliefs. So that ends up being well, at the foreground you here. You could say that Is about that every Christian and Catholic, and you know, a lot of Catholics grow up thinking they were emotionally abused because they were exposed to their parents' beliefs and then when they reject it later on in life. So you can say that, I don't even think that's the issue. 
And, and to talk about freedom of speech, when they're talking about writing on their child and sending the child to school, that's not an issue of freedom of speech, and it wouldn't matter if they were writing teddy bears on a child's forehead. So that, you don't make terrible. a distinction between writing teddy bears, between beliefs, and I've heard that argument, that whatever your beliefs are, it can be challenged, it can be disputed. But when a child comes on an, it, with a swastika, swastika has a connotation, yes. and it says openly, openly here. We want to hear your thoughts on this now. Says openly, quote, black people don't belong. But that's not all that child says. But what people don't understand is that black people should die. Well, that's clearly the product yes. of a sick mind. And it's, I don't well, think it's okay. the child's mind. I now, think it's the parent's it mind. It is the parent's yeah. mind being reflected in the child. But the question is, do you believe that those children should have been taken away by the state based on what they were being taught at home? Just based on what they were being taught? Um, I would say no, you can't take a child away from home. You don't see that as home. psychologically just, abuse? Well, it depends on what's being taught. Yes. If you're just saying as a broad principle, because of what is being taught, well, then the state gets into the home and determines what is proper to taught, you know, teaching and what isn't. And it's not going to stop at racism. It's going to start at religion, at philosophy, at politics, especially politics, um, at, you know, basic... Um, what would you call it? Morality, even. You know, where would the state stop? So based this on what is a moral based issue. on what the state is presenting here, you're saying that they had no right to step in, based on the information here, with the emotional disturbance. Well, I, 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 the child. I haven't got any That's information. That's what's here. <laughs> well, the information again is quote emotionally ba abused through exposure to their parents' beliefs. Well, the article started. The, it, it talked about two the years abuse ago. Is the issue. Yes, not, that's the allegation. Not the beliefs. The allegation the is, is the it's psychological abuse based on the beliefs. Yes. And it seems like what you're saying here is that the state really had no reason to do this. Well, I think they did. I think the reason was abuse. I just think that we're not getting the story out of this newspaper article, because if there is a constellation of parental inadequacies, I'm only hearing one. You're hearing one. You're yeah, hearing I'm one. That's hearing it. number two, three, and that four, and that the was the number the one that came up yeah. two years ago. That was the number one. Stuart, your thoughts on this? Well, I think we're getting... I guess I have two concerns. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think that slippery slope arguments are often made when people feel a kind of, uh, you know, they get a bad visceral reaction mm -hmm. out of something, but they can't see a problem in the actual decision that's been made. And so a slippery slope argument is invoked. But I find that slippery slope arguments are not a very good kind of reasoning. That in fact, most of the time, if you look at slippery slope arguments mm -hmm. that have been deployed in the past, we have not slid down that slope. Most of the time people say, oh, well, it's going to start with religion or, or it's going to start There's with a threat. this group. There's or a threat, it's going though, to, of slipping and, down that slope. And, and, and uh, what I'm saying, though, is that no. If you are opposed to a future policy, a future hypothetical policy, why not oppose that policy when it comes up? rather than opposing a policy that doesn't appear to have anything wrong with it right now. Now, I think what we need to do is focus not on the alleged rights of the parents, but to look at the rights of the children. And I think there's a real problem. A lot mm. of people will put forward a kind of quasi-libertarian viewpoint where they will talk about the home is sacrosanct and how the state can't invade the home. Rights don't attach to households Rights in this children, civilization. Rights attach to individual people. I agree. And I think that when, so we can, so the idea of protecting the rights of a household, I don't think those are real rights. Parents do not have a right to educate their children because that involves treating children as though they're chattel, as though they're extensions of the parent. What we have right now is a conflict between the parents saying we want to educate children in this way and the state saying we want to we want to raise these children in this way and it's the job of the courts to look at which entity is more qualified to protect these children and to look after these children until they reach the age of majority and i don't think that the court has made an error here in bringing in the kinds of views with which these children are being inculcated, the kinds of views they're bringing to school, the effects that those views are gonna have on their experience of school, on their experience of interacting with other children, never mind the views themselves. So I really question, I think the issue is we have to mediate between who is gonna be a good custodian of the rights of the child. 
and I think our default assumption in this society is the household is the best custodian you know what, though, until up, the alternative is demonstrated in court. You bring up something very key here, though, because according to how our family courts go, it is supposed to be in the best interest of the child. Many parents see it as our rights, but it really is in the best interest of the child. And when the state makes a decision on the best interest of the child, a child in need of protection, it could be psychological abuse, it could be physical abuse. In this case, What's being alleged here is that psychological abuse is going on based on how those children are being raised, that it's not good for the child. And that's at stake here, and that's what we're discussing. Now, Robert also pointed out that there were other, um, according to the judge, that there was perhaps or a suggestion of other problems when none was stipulated. Well, two years ago when this first came out, I, I read that article, and mm -hmm. it was exactly the same here. That was the issue. That was the reason why those children were taken away. Let's go now to Gerald on line one to hear what you have to say. Gerald, you're on the line. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for having me on your program. Uh, listen, I think it comes down to the basic raw nature of democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, it, they have the, if uh, enough people say that it's uh, freedom of speech, then it's freedom of speech in a dem democratic uh, society and it's only as good as those who run it mm -hmm. and so here it sounds like they're trying they, they they realize this so they're trying to lean towards the fact that the child may be in an unsafe situation so i really think that democracy is all the, is the best we have but the nature of democracy itself is self-defeating that's all I want to say right now. Thanks. Now, Gerald, if you say the nature of democracy is self-defeating, it, it, you're, you're presenting something interesting there, but what would an alternative be? Well, we don't have an alternative. That's just the, the basic facts of, of life. Uh, the majority is supposed to rule, but the majority never has ruled. It's always been mm. the power of lobby groups and money and... Uh, you, you know, yeah. uh, I don't want to bring up the thing of gays, but let's say they got their their rights well human human rights should cover all rights but because of democracy you get this these these other interest groups that want their rights mm -hmm. and if this is uh... classed as okay it's uh... it's freedom of speech under democratic rule that's the way it is so they have to lean to the fact that the child is in danger Gerald, you got a great premise there, because if I'm gathering this correctly, what you're saying is that, according to democracy, majority rules. Right. That's which basically is a, which it. Which is an incorrect concept of democracy, yes. which is where you're already in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, just because you, the three of us, decide to form a collective doesn't mean we have more rights than we did when we were three individuals, okay? And that's the whole problem with what we call democracy. Democracy, under democracy, in fact, the, the, the process that Gerald was, was describing was anti-democratic, where one group can take money from another or get, get privileges that another group does. That's not democratic. But it's going on. It, yes. It, it's going on. But to, call, so but, but to, but to say that and the I'll problem an is the yeah. nature of democracy is not the, is not the right... Um, okay, Gerald, I'll tell you what. You really opened something up here that's <laughs> going to be leading to more discussion. And Stuart, I'm going to ask you, please, to hold that thought, because we're forced to go for a break. Gerald, thanks. We'll be back after this. Don't go away.
again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Once again, our lines are open. We love to hear your point of view. And we were in the middle of having an interesting discussion here based on what Gerald had to say on his notion of democracy. You were about to answer, Stuart, and I told you to hold that thought. What was it? Oh, well, I, I'm sorry. I just found Gerald's argument um, kind of objectionable and incoherent. The idea, I mean, he used um, the he used the opportunities that gay people have gained to exercise exactly the same rights as everyone else as them being granted special rights due to the power of lobbyists or something and I just I just um, I wasn't putting forward the need to make us a, a complex intellectual argument about democracy I simply wanted to state how objectionable and wrong that individual position was that he'd taken sure I mean I think he answered your question in just the right way you said well there's democracy what's the alternative and I think uh, you know out of respect to him he put forward the Churchillian argument you know Winston Churchill laid it out very clearly democracy is the worst system of government with of course the exception of all others precisely <laughs> I, I think go ahead Robert I think you're taking a little hard on, on Gerald even though I picked on his point too. I think maybe what he was saying was not so much anti-gay rights as such, but no, saying no. that gays have the same rights as everyone else, then they're called individual rights. Of course. There's no such thing as gay rights, black rights, white rights, green rights, farmers' rights. You can name any collective It's human rights. It's human rights. Um, well, I would say individual. Human is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Human is being used to, to um, promote the collective group, the, the, the idea of group rights. And I think that's what Gerald was getting at, was that so much of our quote-unquote democracy has become a battle of group rights. And that's a consequence of a mixed economy. Um, by mixing, we're talking about mixing government controls with freedom. You can't mix the two. As soon as you mix the two, you end up with group rights, and you have one group fighting another, and that's all you see in the parliament. That's, you know, <laughs> we but really don't have government when, when, when groups of people are collectively disenfranchised, um, then them banding, them right banding together yes. to exercise their rights is hardly something that we would find repugnant. It's, I agree. It's, a, a it's, it's, a, it's a good tool. Okay, I'm going to turn this around here as it applies to this particular story. There are many components. We've said clearly there's the rights of the child. Is this child being emotionally damaged psychologically? You brought up a great point, Stuart, because what that child's experience is will be in school as a result of its inherent teaching or, or its belief now um, from what the parents say that once again, quote, in case you tuned in later, that quote, what people don't understand is that black people should die, that they don't belong, and came to school with a swastika. Now, what you said about the child's experiences is one thing. Then there's the right of the family you were you were you were talking about but what's presented in this article is the democratic right to free speech this father is his democratic rights being violated by what you see here having his children being taken away no no okay no. Uh, and, and there's no, yeah, there's no he, issue of free speech. He, 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 he has the right to speak. No one has limited right. the parent's con, right to speak. Mm -hmm. All that has happened is that the child has been moved out of the control yes. of one group mm -hmm. into the control of another group. There's no attempt on the part of the courts to limit this person's indiv individual rights to go to downtown Saskatoon and soapbox in favor of white supremacy every day if that's what Moses Lawn. Okay, let's go now to Andy on line four. Hi, Andy, you're on the line. Yeah, hi, Christine, and hello, guests. Uh, my point is uh, kudos for the judge for having backbone. But the real thing is, you know, like uh, the parents should, uh, you know, they, they should be charged, both of them, okay? There must be some way if, if a smart crown attorney was to uh, uh, thumb through the Zundel decisions vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, his libelous, you know, uh, i.e. printed obscenities versus, you know, slanderous, which is speaking of obscenities, and that is what the parents are doing to that poor child. You know, like, the, you know, the written, uh, the written obscenities on her and her thought process and the way she speaks. I mean, she's got sla slander and libel, and that's from the parents. So go to the Zundel decision and find a way to bust them. Andy, thanks for calling in with your comment. Let's go now to Kathy on Line 7. Hello, Kathy. You're on the line. Yes, hi, Christine. How are you today? Fine, thank you. 
Yes, I, I couldn't disagree with that caller more. Zundel should have stayed in Canada. He didn't do anything that thousands and thousands of Canadians don't do, maybe not in the open. The other thing, that child didn't act out. The swastika was on his hand, but he didn't act out. The parent didn't act out. It is free speech. Have you heard of the situation in London where a teacher was bullied by a, a, a classroom full of Muslim children, and he was called names, and he went to the principal, and he was promptly fired? He was fired. Nothing happened to the children. So what is happening to those children at home? Hmm. Kathy's got a point here. Do any of you want to reply to it? Because, well, yes, go ahead. Again, free, free speech, you know, people think that free speech means you can say whatever you want, whenever wherever you want, want no whenever consequence. you want. Um, not even, never mind the consequence. I have freedom of speech. It doesn't mean I can come here on your show anytime I feel like it and say what I want. I'm here as your guest. This is the property of CTS. But that let our viewers know. Where... I don't coach him. No, no, he does no. say what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, that, but I always understand that. Um, if I'm in someone else's home, I have to abide by the rules of that home. If they mm -hmm. want me to take the shoes off, my shoes off at the doorway, I will take my shoes off at the doorway. It's as simple as that, and that's where your rights end. And you have a right to say whatever you want in your own home, with your own property, with your own resources, and that's all that that freedom of speech ever meant. And to say that you have a right to exercise that freedom of speech at someone else's expense mm -hmm. is not freedom of speech anymore. You got a point there. It, it's would you say it's a responsibility attached to that free speech always. that we're still obviously it's a work in progress well always there, there's consequence you should be able to say whatever you want whatever you believe in you should not have to worry about the state coming down on you mm -hmm. for uh, expressing your opinions that when you think you can walk into another you know we have such a mess because we have government run schools so everybody thinks they own the school yes you see so they think they have that their home freedoms extend into the home or into the school rather because it's part of um, the government which they mm -hmm. think is is an extension of something they're paying for well it's not the, the school should be viewed even if it's run by the government as a private institution and it should be private okay. <laughs> and then we wouldn't have these problems I know you think it should be that's going out of JBED on line one hello you're on the line Go ahead, Jabed. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for allowing me. Before I continue, I, I um, really wanted to emphasize a little small parable which has been uh, given to uh, us for about 1,400 years ago about the dom democratic uh, uh, vision. And they define that democracy is like a ship uh, with the two floors, floor at the bottom, floor at the floor at the top, and the people living at the bottom floor, people living at the top floor, the board democratically decide that we have rights, so we can do whatever we want at each other floor. One day, the people at the bottom floor decide, that, well, why do we have to climb up all the way? We can just dig a hole, get all the water we want. Why do we have to climb up all yeah, the way? Yeah, but I'm going to ask you the question. Do you think that these children should have been taken away from the parents? Oh, I, I was talking, referring to the, uh, not to the children, I was referring more of the democratic views. Uh, 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 basically, what, what we were talking about, the democracy. Okay. So you're making a point about what you think about democracy. That, uh, will the people on the, uh, about this, from this parable, the people on the top row, will it allow them, the people at the bottom floor, to dig a hole? I mean, you cannot emphasize individualistic rights hmm. compared to the collective rights. So there is no such thing as a total freedom in the democracy. You got a point there. You got a point. Do you want to answer to this? Yes, He's there got is a good total point. freedom in a democracy. It's, yeah. Um, and a democracy cannot work without freedom. Uh, democracy doesn't work in any other system, any kind of socialism, collectivism, anything, because it, it breaks down at the source. Freedom in a democracy doesn't mean you can do anything you want. You know what we call that? Strangely enough, mm -hmm. license. Hmm, Guess yeah. who gives licenses out? Government. The state. The state. That's right. Freedom. And so people always say, you know, I want freedom, not license. License is being able to do whatever you want. If you've got a license to broadcast in this province or in this country, you can broadcast and the other guy can't. Now, that's legitimate within a certain, you know, protecting someone's frequency, but that's another issue. But giving them permission just to be able to do it, that's a whole other thing. And so freedom has within itself its own limits. I can't be free unless you're free. And as soon as one of us isn't, we, neither of us has freedom by definition. You can't change that. Freedom is that absolute. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks that, oh, no, you can't. Yeah, of course you can't. That's, that's the whole point of freedom, that you can't go around shooting and killing people. A, a question I'm going to add to this to hear what the two of you think about it. 
I've heard this come up before. I've heard it by Muslims on the show as well, where there are certain destructive ideologies, believing, and again, it's in the very vast minority, not the majority, okay? It's not the vast majority of Muslims living in our country are, they want the best for our society, they're Canadians. But there is that small group that goes around with that destructive ideology that believes that Christians should be killed, Jews should be killed, this one should be, um, should be wiped off the face of the map. Suppose it's found that a child comes to school and starts speaking this way. Should that child be taken away by the state? My concern here is there are a lot of very destructive ideologies in different camps in our society. So does it come down to if that child goes to school and opens his or her mouth, then that child will be taken away from the parents? And hence the slippery slope. You've actually drawn a perfect that parallel to this case, haven't you? I don't, I don't think yes. that, that that's a... I don't think that's a slippery slope. I think that but the, it's, it does reasonable, the it's a reasonable it's, okay, for the state okay. to intervene yes. in these situations. I don't think that I don't think that Nazis are special in the sense that we should only pay attention when they advocate Pick murderous on them, for ideologies. Example. Right. Um, certainly, and I, I nor do I think that um, uh, nor do I think that uh, that Muslim extremists should be singled out in this way. I think that sadly, Everybody. there are plenty of. And one of the other things is this doesn't even have to be formalized in terms of a political ideology. This doesn't have to be part of a movement. There can be individual parents who are raising their children, uh, who are raising their children to espouse utterly repugnant Hatred and incorrect values. And thinking and another group should be to, killed. Yes, and it doesn't have to be grounded in an ideology. No, because, no, no. Because to dress it up as an ideology gives it, it a dignity. It gives it a dignity yes. that it doesn't deserve. This is, first and foremost, bad parenting. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. Let's go now to Anne on line seven. Hello, Anne. You're on the line. Hello. Um, I, I think the... Um, the discussion around um, democracy is misleading. I think this child was used in a way that is child abuse. Um, Eunice Spry, who was a very notorious child abuser, wrote, uh, pinned a note on one, her, on one of her stepdaughters and said, this child is evil, um, shun her, something to that effect. Uh, and I think that children are not pieces of paper to write on whatever you want. It makes them a target. And I think that's really the relevant point here. And thank you so much for calling in and expressing that bingo. view. And, mm -hmm. yep, our guest here, Robert, says bingo. And I think, Stuart, uh, yeah, that's the central thing here. Now, once again, this guy's lawyers, of course, they're using the democratic argument that his free speech was violated. But, once again, we're looking at something else here, the well-being of the kid. That, that's also um, foremost. And you, said, you hit a good point there, when you, Stuart, when you talked about you can dress it up as anything, whether it's an ideology, whether it's something personal. You've got people teaching children that one group should be killed by way of their race or what they believe in. That's very dangerous, very dangerous. Well, that's advocating yes. out and out violence. And, and once you cross, that's the line you cross. That's the line, you know, okay. I, mean, I, I think that's pretty black and white. <laughs> yep, and we're going to go for a break now. When we come back, we're going to be looking at our second story, Ottawa taking a Vancouver safe injection site to Supreme Court. We'll be back after this. Don't go away.
Hello again, and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're going to be going on to story number two very shortly. But first, let's go to Brenda on line four. Hello, Brenda. You're on the line. Hi there. Hi, Brenda. Yes, um, I want to pick up on something that Mr. Um, Menzies or Menz Robert <laughs> said Metz. about the difference between having freedom and having license. I think every parent in Canada must know that the Children's Aid Society has license to apprehend our children. So whether they should or not is never a relevant question. They just do sometimes. And those parents were negligent in protecting their child from being apprehended by putting that swastika on their head, knowing that this is Canada and a swastika is going to ring alarm bells for everybody in positions of authority. Mm -hmm. Brenda, thanks for calling in with that comment. What Robert, a, do you want... We were talking about want, that yes, during we the were, break, weren't yes, we? Yes, we were. About my discomfort with this whole circumstances this year, because yes. I have seen other reports that don't jive with this one. So mm -hmm. I'm feeling very iffy about the whole situation, and I know that the mother didn't seem as wacko as she's written up to the be. Mother, yeah, we were talking and about that during the break, that the mother's not even with the dad anymore. In fact, she had actually put in to try to get those kids under her custody, and that didn't seem to go through. But they're not together right now. And I've got to tell you, I've gotten a lot of uh, calls over the years over Children Aid Society apprehensions that I really can't do anything about because it's a legal case. You know, yes. people call me up because I'm in politics thinking yeah, I can do right. something about it and I really nope. can't. Yep, thanks for calling yeah. in with that, Brenda. We're going to go on to story number two now and take a look at the headline Ottawa takes injection battle to top court. Now, this one, I, I'll be honest with you folks, I have a hard time with this one because it, it's, it's, the, it's the full case of what you call what's known as harm reduction. Now, this particular site, it's called Insight. It's a safe injection site. You've got these people, in a nutshell, that here's the argument for the site. They're going to go do it anyway. And by going out, using needles that are unsafe, that are dirty, that are contaminated, they're going to be spreading disease all over society. So Insight actually allows a nurse to oversee the process while the drug addicts go and they shoot up on all kinds of things. The other side of the argument is, is this really the right way to do it? And that's what Ottawa is talking about here because quoted in this article is the Justice Minister Rob Nicholson who says that he agrees that drug addicts need help. For example, and I'm just throwing this out there, you've got detox centers. Somebody goes to a detox center, um, you happen to give them the necessary amount of drug while they come down. Is that a possible option as opposed to having a safe injection site where they go in? I, I don't know what the limit is here, but are you comfortable with the idea of the harm reduction? Well, first go of ahead. all, let's yes. be very clear that it's not like Insight developed in Vancouver to deal with the downtown east and side. And you were out there. You were out there. Yeah, you were out there. During the time that I lived there. Insight developed because we, you know, one of the richest cities in one of the richest, I mean, we managed to get the downtown east side in Vancouver to have the highest HIV infection rate in North America. So, first of all, let's be very clear here that this is not about mm -hmm. diseases. This is... Uh, this involves HIV and the spread, hepatitis. The spread of yes, hepatitis this involves and HIV. the, the yes. epidemic of HIV and hepatitis. Now, detox, all of these other things, there are ample facilities that do those things. There are all kinds of facilities in the downtown east side and in Greater Vancouver generally that use more traditional approaches to dealing with injection drug use. And most people needs are met through those facilities, not through the Insight Safe Injection oh, yeah. it's, it's a different thing altogether. So we have to look at the fact that you have an epidemic and you have a bunch of kinds of facilities that have been introduced to deal with various parts of the epidemic and that those facilities collectively were insufficient and so uh, Insight was added. Now what I find really bizarre here is mm -hmm. if you listen to Stephen Harper's government talk about health care in any other situation. They emphasize with great relish how this is a provincial responsibility and how the federal government really has been exercising far too much authority over health care. Here we have a moment where a provincial government takes an innovative new approach to deal with a health care problem that is local to a particular part of that province and suddenly Stephen Harper 
you know, moves to the kind of autocratic federalism of a Trudeau in saying, no, 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 healthcare has to be the same everywhere. All of these sort of conservative principles of letting provinces run their own health care are suddenly thrown to the wayside the moment there's something that is offensive to this government's idea of going back to so a 1980s-style drug war. So we need to be clear that Insight's war. goal here is to stem the spread of HIV and hepatitis. Because obviously with the mention of when it's stated here that Nicholson talks about helping the addicts, that's a different that's a different thing. I think all together. I, I would not even true. This here is mm -hmm. to stem he insight, to stem the spread of disease. Insight so you agree, to. you agree with that kind of a harm reduction to provide the safe injection site. Uh, yes, it, it both gives the addicts a better life and it reduces the mm -hmm. spread of disease. So what would these individuals be doing otherwise? And that's it's the argument. That's the what, argument. Uh, it's not a question of, you know, what should they be doing in the ideal world in which Rob Nicholson would like to move Vancouver's downtown east side. We would all like Vancouver's downtown east side to be in a place where conventional detox facilities are sufficient. But the situation has gone so far beyond that. Okay. Your thoughts here, uh, you Robert. Know, do you agree I, with the harm reduction thing? I, I don't have a, an objection to it. Doctors seem to agree with it. I, my objection would be who's financing it. I don't think it's the taxpayers, it's yeah, taxpayers. It, should, it shouldn't it's be, taxpayers. it should be financed in other ways, but let's just put that one aside. I don't think that's the issue we want to get into. I think the I, real, um, the real, wants to. Well, okay, well, <laughs> no, no, no. I, was, I, I, I think the real issue here is, I don't think the federal government's interested in helping addicts because they say, quote, our national anti-drug strategy focuses on prevention. So you're not supposed mm -hmm. to be an addict in the first place. <laughs> so forget about helping you. Once you're an addict, in the jail cell you go, because right now they want mandatory minimum sentences for some of the most you know, even, even small possessions of amounts of marijuana. But here's what they're after, and this is the great point that I agree with Stuart. They, they bring up, this case raises important questions regarding the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity and the division of powers between the federal and provincial governments. That's all they care about, is they want their power because the drug laws, drug prohibition is a federal um, jurisdiction. And they've got a lot of pressure being put on them right now, especially from the United States. You've got, um, you know, the Prince of Pop, Mark Emery, who is awaiting extradition right at this moment. He's out, out of jail right now just for selling seeds, let alone doing anything that they're, that they're doing openly here under government, you know, paid uh, auspices. It's just amazing what's going on. What a mess the whole drug situation is in this country because we ever touched prohibition in the first so place. So the only difference the two of you have here is that you don't think the state should be paying for it. Well, to the you extent that the state is run. involved in health care already, I can't argue about that, okay? I don't think the state should be paying for most of our health care. But uh, that's, where my, that's where the argument is, because that, there's two injustices being done then. But you agree um, with the, the premise of harm reduction? I can't disagree with it, because I'm not a doctor, and I haven't heard anybody But well, you have an opinion, because well, I'll, I'll, I'll give opinion. you an example. I'll well, give you an example about no, harm reduction. No, I can't reduction. have an opinion. No, of course I, I, that's why you're here, Robert, to, to have an opinion. To me, I think it has to match reality and what people are yes. telling me. I'd like to think yes. otherwise, but if doctor after doctor after doctor says, yes, this works, this has, a, has, a, has an effect, um, we're helping people, we're reducing disease, is that a fact? Yes. How can I argue with those? And also, those Robert points out, we've had nearly a century of experience with prohibition regimes and how they've gone. And British Columbia has always been on the leading edge of taking prohibition down. When prohibition was brought in, in uh, nationally, the government of British Columbia's reaction was to license every liquor store clerk as a pharmacist so that they could keep prescribing alcohol to, um, uh, to uh, across the logging and mining camps in the province. And I think that uh, this is just the latest phase in British Columbia being one of the first places to look at a regime of prohibition, seeing what a failure it is as public policy. You and your arguments of prohibition, I ought to get with you with, a, um, with crime expert Anthony Nakasa, who will disagree with you all the way. We'll have to have you on a panel here, because this <laughs> argument is turning into one <laughs> of prohibition. But there's another angle that we don't seem to be presenting here, and uh, it, it's the ethics. Now, these two here are not ethicists. They're more um, on the political angle of thing. But this whole notion of harm reduction, I mean, we see it even in schools will hand out the condoms because the kids are doing it anyway. Is there any, do you draw the line there at all? And I'll give you an example. 
A 16-year-old girl. A, well, that's the thing. That's what we're arguing here. A 16-year-old girl actually came to me once and told me this. My mom allows me to have guys in the house up in the bedroom because the alternative is that I go outside all over the place and do it. Here is a glowing example of harm reduction. Ethically speaking, is there a is there any is there is there a place to draw the line for this? Because it makes sense. A lot of it can make sense, but from an ethical argument, an ethical standpoint, how does it sit with the two of you? The example you just raised? That one and harm reduction. It, it's, uh, it's, well, a, it's an example harm reduction of, well, if you don't do this, or if you don't hand out these condoms in school, then the kids are going to do it anyway, so it's going to be worse, so you might as well provide the way of the least harm. That's what harm reduction is about. Well, if we want Ethically to, if, speaking. Well, what's, again, what's its opposite? If somebody's going to engage in a certain behavior anyway, Mm -hmm. and you know they are. That's the, that, we're starting that, that's at that it. point. That's okay? the ethical argument. Now, it, yes. Well, that's not, but it's not your ethics. It's the other person's ethics. Yes. And then, so yes. that's not your But you not see, not you're going under business. the premise they're going to be doing it anyway. Uh, right. And that is the argument. But should we be focusing more resources on finding out or what, what perhaps, because there are always risk factors when people get involved with certain types of behaviors. For example, we know about self-medicating when it comes to um, people that have addiction problems. I mean, it, it goes back, but is it too easy to use the harm reduction approach? Does it sit well with you ethically? That's what I'm asking you. Well, it sits very well with me ethically because we're engaged in a conversation about what actually happens in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Our objective, and you see, I think many people get upset with harm reduction because they think, well, somehow... You're condoning it. We're, yes. That's how it's We're seen. condoning mm -hmm. it, and people who wouldn't otherwise do these things will do them because we're enabling it. And I just see no you evidence don't, you don't see of that. that. Okay. I just, for instance, you look at something like marijuana use, prior to prohibition, um, Marijuana was viewed as a very low-class drug because it was very inexpensive to grow, it was very inexpensive to move, and so its use was really limited to a particular socioeconomic groups. Prohibition comes along, it raises the price of marijuana, it makes it look transgressive, it makes it look sexy, and what do you know, marijuana use spreads across all kinds of income demographics that had never been in before. And I ultimately think that whether we are prohibiting something or whether you're saying, look, we don't like this, but if you have to do it, just you know, keep it out of the way. I don't think that makes any difference in terms of whether so you agree this with the behavior concept. is socially approved. You agree with that of. concept. Well, okay. you yes. know, ethically, it's always better to do less harm than more harm. Would, it not, would that not be a basic ethic premise? It depends <laughs> on how far back you take it, because sometimes there's, a, there's that presupposition that the person will definitely do it. Well, in your Point example Blake. of the parent with her, with yes. her daughter, yes. uh, you know, I think Stuart used the right word. She may be to some degree degree enabling that daughter instead of saying well, well, if you want to do at what this, point? it's time for you to move out and be an adult okay, precisely. and do it in your own Now property. the big question <laughs> raised there by what you said, which was great, is at what point does harm reduction become harmful in itself? We're going to go for, well, the, you if, have something it, to say if there. It, if it is harmful in and of itself, then which it, it can defies be. the definition which it can of be. harm reduction. Which it can be, that's and right. that's what it Robert pointed out. It ceases to be harm reduction yes. if you're making things worse with it. Yes, yeah, so it needs so to be analyzed. So can, yes, so you can simply test. Is this process mm -hmm. reducing HIV infection rates? Is but this can, process reducing... Now, I promised you guys to get to topic three, so we're going to go for a break. We'll be back with it after this. <laughs> Don't go away. <laughs>
Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line, taking a look at the third subject on your screen. Canada presses China on Iran nuclear file. Now you might wonder in this article, well, why is Canada pressing China? Well, according to this, Iran and China are the best trade buddies. In fact, if you look at this, what's contained here, China has actually expanded Iran's role when it comes to their trade back and forth economically. And how, well, we know what, what their nuclear um, stance is, Iran. At one point, they were denying on uh, about um, those uranium deposits. Now we know it's openly declared last week that they are a nuclear nation. It's been open, it's been declared. Problem is, should China, be, should China be doing something about this? And do you think Canada will have any luck whatsoever in doing so? Let's start with you on this one. Well, this is really unfortunate because mm -hmm. if you look at where China was on this issue 12 years ago, it was in a very different place. Three years before 9-11, China, India, and Russia came together and mm -hmm. said, look, Iran and other Islamic fundamentalist states in Central Asia present the single biggest security threat in Asia. We need to, we need to come together and work on this. Fast forward 12 years, we have the absurd situation now of China being so interested in maintaining its good economic relationship with Iran that um, we have China as the sole defender of Iran mm -hmm. in the UN Security Council. Uh, are we going to are we going to get anywhere pressuring China? Certainly, this government is not going to get anywhere. But I think that even Why do you somebody say so? highly Let's friendly. Let's stop for a minute. Why do you say certainly not well, this government? Um, mm -hmm. This, there was a recent uh, this, trade this prime minister was recently dressed down in front of the Chinese people for his anti-China positions. So if we even if but even if we have we the got, glad I have handing Jean Chrétien, we really got Chrétien, part of the story there. Even if we yeah. have the glad handing Jean Chrétien, I don't think Chrétien could do anything about it. But if there there's ever been a Canadian government since Trudeau's that has zero traction in China. It's the current one. Personally, I thought that gave gave Harper a lot of traction. It was a, China was a actually thing. commended Canada, commended Harper when it came to the Chinese head tax. Now, this unfortunately didn't get reported in the regular media, but I did have the opportunity to speak to a couple people that actually went on that trade mission. And Canada made a lot of headway when it came to that trade mission to China. So to say that Canada doesn't have any pull in China based on that, tough I think, to say. I, I didn't because, say it doesn't yes. have any pull. I said it has less pull with the this least government saying, than yes. any previous government and, and that going is, back that to is not necessarily so. And, uh, but regardless, the issue is what is going to move China on the Iran nuclear file, and I think there, what uh, I think, I think there ultimately that's a problem that has to be solved within the Middle East. China has a set of strategic interests in Central Asia, and if there are other states that help China meet those strategic needs, mm -hmm. it will become less important for yes. them to maintain their relationship with Iran. Another thing to add on, I'm going to get to you shortly, Robert, but another, another part to add to this, um, if you've got that picture of that globe, let's put it on the screen. There's a small story beside, there you go, where Israel did get wiped off the map. This is very disturbing. This was a globe. You can't see the contents of it there, but the article is talking about Israel not being a part of that map, and that's what happened. This was a toy that was made in China, a globe widely circulated in the States, particularly in Target stores. It, it made a lot of sales. A lot of kids have it in their, in their houses today. The sad thing is, where Israel is, the word Palestine, the name Palestine is there instead. So Israel literally on this globe with a Chinese made globe got wiped off the face of this map, which I find sad enough to say. But with China, would the two of you not say though that China historically has shown stubbornness? Basically China does what it wants. Um, well, certainly, this is this is <laughs> typical of any great world power like the United States, like China. You do what you want, uh, but ultimately, what's funny here is that this arises out of the deregulation of the Chinese economy. This is these are privately made globes mm -hmm. in private stores that are part of a U.S.-based franchise selling them in China. So, I am very happy to tar the Chinese state with committing unspeakable atrocities and doing terrible things. But it's very hard to blame the Chinese state for something that a mm -hmm. deregulated part of their economy making luxury goods mm -hmm. has done. So 
I think that the uh, I think there are lots of reasons the Palestine thing could have ended up there based on the politics of the people at that company, but I don't think could that be. we can mm -hmm. infer that this is in any way associated with the um, Chinese Communist Party, which has bigger fish to fry. Okay, go ahead, Robert. I think it's always unrealistic to expect any nation, particularly a communist one, that doesn't really respect individual rights, yes, um, not mm -hmm. to act in its own interest against anyone else's interest. It's just not rational. However, that does not make um, any sort of criticism, whether by Stephen Harper or me just writing a letter to the editor, <laughs> uh, not valid. Because what it does, and I've learned this myself, is it puts you on the record. And if you're on the record so and, the, and the world stage sees what you have said, yes. and then they wait and they, they want to see how the other superpower responds. There's a paper trail. That's where the moral power is right there. You got that paper trail. Yeah. Thank you both so much for joining me today. It was great having you. Us. That's all the time we have for today. See you again next time. I'm Christine Williams, and from all of us, thank you for watching.